Have you ever heard these words? Now stop it. And don't make me come back there. Okay. Um, you know, certainly on, on trips like this, um, there's, you, you know, you're, you're with family for maybe a longer period of time and uh, it, it, somebody crosses your line and so you've got a choice to make whether to die to yourself or, or somebody gets um, just a little more relaxed like this next picture, just a little more relaxed, you know, and they're traveling down the road and you're going, you know what? That's not legal, first of all. Would you cut that out and put your seatbelt on and all that? Um, so what we're going to find out today is um, God, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus, he's called you to get along with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, so if you've been having some difficulty with that, maybe he's going to say to you, cut that out. Am I going to have to come back there? You know, am I going to have to... Straighten you out. So um, turn to chapter 2 of Acts. And we've been um, in the series called Startup, and we've been following the first church. And what has happened is the power to follow God is the Holy Spirit. So at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples, and they immediately the Spirit uh, compelled them to speak the mighty deeds of God. And so they were, they were ready, and Jesus said, go and wait till the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be his witness. You're going to have the power to be his witness. And so the Holy Spirit came down, and they automatically then began sharing the mighty deeds of God. And so we looked at, Peter, um, he began to explain, so now Peter, filled with the Spirit of God, boldly stands up and begins to proclaim the mighty deeds of God, even using Scripture. And that's beautiful, and that's a good example for all of us, how we can use Scripture to speak the mighty deeds of God. Um, and so through this time, we've recognized, and you've recognized for a long time, that what God has called you into this new life since you've believed in the Lord Jesus is not to be lived in your own strength. That you need to be empowered with a supernatural spirit because you're supposed to um, look like Jesus. Your actions, the way that you conduct your life is supposed to reflect Jesus. And that's why the gift of the Holy Spirit is that you would live the witness life and you would speak boldly who Jesus is. And uh, so um, last week we did something very unusual here at the church. We happened to be right on, if you're in Acts chapter 12, or chapter 2, sorry, chapter 2, uh, we are right at the place where um, it says that they were... Um, uh, so I'm, I'm too far back here. Okay, at 30, verse 37. So right after Peter explains that they were part of killing the Messiah, the one that was promised to come into the world. And it says in 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what should we do? And so we... We ended up in verse 38, and Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and um, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So last week, um, we, um, I prayed with the elders, and I said, I'm going to, I believe the Lord's wanting me to do something a little unusual, and that is to provide a baptism right here, right here as we give this invitation. And so many of you are here, and I saw your eyes when I opened up the lid. The drums were off to the side. I, I opened up the lid, and I'd filled the tank the night before, and I started taking off my boots and my keys and my phone. And uh, three of you said, I want to give my life 100% to the Lord, and I, and I want people to know. And so I just thank you so much for taking that step. 
Um, it wasn't a first time baptism for you. Each of you said, no, I've been baptized before, but I want to make this uh, profession. And uh, so I, I just thank you. And so we opened up the lid and, and then we had a couple of young men go down and, and come out and they were just saying, I want to I want to live 100 percent for the Lord and I want everybody to know in this room. And so praise the Lord. You know, I know there's many of you, if not most of you and maybe all of you. We're saying the same thing, okay? I, I'm not going to go forward to the baptism. I don't see the Lord calling me for that. But I, too, want to just, you know, draw a line in the sand and say, I want to be 100% on so that the Holy Spirit can totally take me and use me wherever he wants. And so um, thank you. Uh, God knows your heart, and thank you for even uh, being here and witnessing that. And so then the elders asked me this week, are you going to do something else that's going to shock us at the end of the sermon? Because typically we have baptism classes to make sure you understand. But the scripture right there said, if you believe, come on, you know. So, um, okay, we're not going to shock you. The tank is empty today. But we are going to schedule. I've had a person come up, a family say, there is uh, someone in the family who wants to be baptized. And so we will... Um, talk to the family, and then we'll schedule a baptism coming up soon. So if there's anybody else that wants to be baptized for the first time, um, that's what this next one's about, the first time if you want to be baptized. So believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It, baptism is an, an outward expression of what's already happened inside. Amen? Okay, so you're just going public saying, I, I want to do this. So here we are, and... That's what happened last week, and what we're about to see, so you're in chapter 2 of Acts, is uh, the response of the people when, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now, just to make sure you understand, throughout the Bible, you see God work in a very supernatural ways that were huge, like the dividing of the Red Sea. This was a huge, you know, that bringing the people out of, out of Egypt, this was huge, and then, you know, there's times when you don't see a lot, but, but there's faith still happening. And then the Holy Spirit shows up and d does another huge thing. We see um, God's Spirit being upon people like David and, and uh, Joshua, uh, Joseph in the Old Testament. Joshua, of course. And, and so there's, there's times where people are just living the faith. And then there's these moments where it's just huge that God is doing something historical. And so what's happening here, this is mind-blowing. And we can't reproduce this because this is the time when the Holy Spirit comes on not just the leaders of Israel, but on everyone. No matter how young and how, how old, no matter how much schooling you had or not, the Holy Spirit has come on all that, those who believe, and they begin living that witness life. Their life, conduct, and the words they speak, they're glorifying God. They're, they're um, bringing Him all the attention. And so we see something happening here that is very unusual, and there's times when it happens, and it even just happens here at different times individually. But the reaction or what happens to the people afterwards when um, they, it says, so uh, if you're in Acts chapter 2, go to verse 41. It says, so then those who had received his word, uh, Peter, were baptized and uh, there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And in verse 42, it says, And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So the, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they wanted to know more. And they were hungry to know more, so they were listening to the apostles' teach. So what we're going to do is we're going to look through, we're going we're to hang right around verse 42 for a little bit because that sets up the rest to follow. And let me, let me just read that. If you have it on the screen, let me just read that this whole passage beginning at verse 42 through 47. And I'm, I'm slowing down a little bit, just making sure my tech guys are, are with me here. So uh, if you have your scriptures, uh, you can look up on the screen. But why don't you stand with me as I read this portion of scripture, okay, for two reasons. 
One is that we just want to honor God um, just to read scripture. And, and the other is, is that some of you are starting to fall asleep. So we just, just help you out a little bit here. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 43, And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing in one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. Bless the reading of God's word. You may be seated. So go back to verse 42, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here. And depending on the clock, um, there's something very, very critical that um, the Lord wants to teach me, and He's been working on me for years. But again, today, um, I just want to say, when I'm, when I'm teaching or preaching, I'm also teaching me and reminding me. And um, so wherever you are in your journey, the Lord has something for you today. And so grab hold of that, whether it's something that's reminding you or maybe something new. But the Holy Spirit is doing something today, and be ready to receive that. So the first thing, it says they continued devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Who were the apostles? And, um, well, they were fishermen. And the strange thing is that fishermen don't teach people. That's what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law do. And so there's something very unusual. These, these fishermen, there was quite a few actually that were uh, apostles, um, uh, were a part of this. They were speaking the mighty deeds of God and they were sharing this with all the people. Well, why don't you go back to uh, even in Acts chapter 1, and let's see, let's just name the apostles. Go back to Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 13. It says, And when they entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, where they were staying and Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Okay, so we just, we just named the eleven there. So go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. What impresses me is that in them, when you read other references, you find out that there was a set of twins in there. And I don't know um, how many in, the, in this room are or twins, but I know at least Ron had a brother, Don. Ron and Don were twins. Ron passed away a couple years ago. There was an accident and passed away. Is there another twin? Anybody else a twin? There's another twin. Yvonne's a twin. So if you see somebody else walking around, you'll go, wait a minute. Yeah, but he was a brother. Oh, he was a brother. Okay. <laughs> Just change the hair a little bit and, okay. yeah, okay. All right. Oh, another. Oh, well, look at this. Okay. Um, Hannah and uh, Lily. Okay, so we've got two. Could you stand up for a minute if you don't mind? Stand up for a minute. Okay, before you leave here, you've got to be able to say who they are, tell them apart. So Hannah's on with the orange shirt and Lily's with the dress. Did I get that right? Okay, thank you. Didn't mean to embarrass you. But okay, so in, in Jesus' first group, he had twins. That's pretty awesome. And uh, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus, he's called you whether you're a twin or not, but it's pretty special. He had twins. He had fishermen, and I'm, I'm so impressed that these fishermen that really weren't schooled were now schooling the people, that they had spent three years being trained by the Messiah, Jesus, God himself. Pretty impressive. And you know what? That's hopeful for me because that means that God can take almost, no, he can take anyone. 
I drove truck for a lot of my life. I grew up driving truck. I never thought that I'd be standing up in this pulpit. I thought I'd be behind that steering wheel, you know, shifting gears and dumping gravel and all that kind of stuff. So if God can use me, then guess what? You are on the spot too. He can use wherever you are from or however young or however old. Isn't that encouraging? That God says, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for somebody that has a heart after me. And watch out. And even those of you that are getting gray hair and older, he's not finished with you yet. He's got stuff for you. So hold on, you know. So here he is. And there was even a tax collector that everybody despised the tax collector because they were known to cheat people out of their money. So he was even in the group. Oh, amazing who Jesus called. And they were witnessing. So these were, what was special about the apostles, they were eyewitnesses. They were the first-hand experience. They had been with Jesus. And so when these men spoke, people were listening to them. Is that awesome? So just to make sure that's... So keep your finger here and go to um, 2 Peter chapter 1. Go to the back of your Bible. If you get to Revelation, just thumb just a little bit back in and you'll find 2 Peter. There's 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Um, so... Um, 2 Peter chapter 1, these were first-hand witnesses. I hope I did my cross-reference right here. I've got a couple of Peters down here, so when I get there. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1, um, 1 through 16, no, that's 16, chapter 1, verse 16. And I'm in 1 Peter um, those of you that are struggling with finding it, you're right with me. We're, we'll get there. Okay, Second Peter chapter, um, Second Peter chapter one verse sixteen. So here's Peter talking. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as, as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day, dawn, day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So we'll get from Peter right away. Um, a sample of Peter's teachings that they were eyewitnesses, and he wanted to make sure that, that the people understood that. And so what an, what an honor to listen to them. Um, so what Peter's making sure of, and another sample of what the mighty works or mighty deeds that Peter's speaking, is uh, that he makes sure that they understand he's the Messiah, so right here, even in Acts chapter 2, um, verse 36, he says this, Let all the house of Israel know for certain that, this God, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. So, so my, my, my thinking as I was approaching this is, what were the disciples teaching? What, what were they teaching the people now that were gathered to them? And you can be sure that they were saying, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. So we hear, hear Peter doing it right here. Um, another reference, uh, Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 17. But let's, let's go, if you're still in Peter, um, Peter says something very important that he was teaching, and I don't know if he was teaching it right there, but certainly we have a sample of Peter's teaching. Uh, 1 Peter again, 1 Peter chapter 1, and very critical in how he's teaching them to live their lives 
to obey God. So 1 Peter again, you were in 2 Peter last time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. This is a sample of Peter's teaching, one of the apostles teaching the people what it could be. He could have been saying even right there. It says in verse uh, 13, Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and watch this very closely, because this is why we need the Holy Spirit, because we cannot attain this next part right here. He says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. So before you knew Christ. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all of your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, we can't get there from here. You and I, we look at ourselves and we go, I am not holy. But he says, be holy as I am holy. This is the job of the Holy Spirit to change your way of living that you would begin looking more and more like the Holy One. And ultimately, because of Christ, you are holy. You, so you're lining up your thinking with what is true. He has made you holy. In order to enter the kingdom of God, your sins have to be forgiven. And that's what this holy talking is about. So now the practical living out is when those things get, come up, how do I live this holy life in this situation? How do I live this Jesus life in these different situations? There's so many situations. How do I do this and not cheat and not do these things that, that are the way of the world or the way of my flesh. So this is Holy Spirit stuff. That's why we've been given the Holy Spirit, because every day we need to make the decisions to honor the one, the Holy One who's called us. Back to Acts chapter 2. So we are talking about samples of Peter's teaching. Um, another one, and I'm going to start condensing it here, is there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was resurrected. And in that portion of Scripture, Jesus, it says that Jesus began to teach them of himself in the Scriptures. And so very important to understand the disciples were teaching how does the Scriptures, how is Jesus in the Scriptures? Okay, so um, if, you're, if you're taking notes, that would be uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 27 specifically. So we're looking at samples of what the disciples or the apostles were teaching. For sure he's the Christ, and for sure there's scripture. Peter even quoted scripture, but for sure scripture is being used to support that Jesus was the one promised to come. So then John, one of the other apostles, is teaching too, and we have samples of his teaching in the book of John and 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. And I was thinking, what are, what are John's big teachings? Well, in, in John 14 through 16, John is teaching about the Holy Spirit. So here's the apostle teaching about the Holy Spirit. So I'm just talking about samples of the different apostles and what they were teaching. And we have them written right here that it's recorded. This is the kind of stuff they were teaching. One of the things we find out about John also is John is the one that talked the most about love, that God is love, especially in 1 John, that God is love. So here's the apostles. They're bringing up who Jesus is and God's amazing love plan. And here's Peter, for sure the sample of Jesus being the Son of God. And sure, John does that too. But here's John being the, the love disciple. He's the one that keeps bringing this this love part up. So that brings us then to this next word that's coming up in, in uh, Acts chapter 2. So it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And then they were also teaching fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So they were also teaching that part of it, how, we, uh, how we're supposed to get along, okay? 
how we're supposed to get along. So this fellowship, we're going we're gonna to look at that. And we might run out of time just on this part. And, and really, um, it's because it's the most important um, that we need to understand as the Holy Spirit comes upon us. This fellowship, first of all, with this holy God. What, is, what does it look like between you and God? What, what does that relationship look like? And then another way is, how should it look? If, if, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus, then you've been talking to him. You've been praying, and, and there's certain ways that you do that. Um, and some of you are bold enough to come out on a prayer night or even a, a gathering, and you allow people to hear you talk to God. Isn't that? That's pretty awesome. That's a pretty intimate thing. So we're starting out talking about this relationship with God that that you have, that I have, that those that have believed in him have. Um, so um, for those of you that like Greek, the Strong's number is uh, 2842, uh, koinonia. And uh, so this, there's a bunch of words that, that kind of speak about this fellowship thing. And I'll just read some of those. Our participation in the same thing. So participation... Um, communion, community, communication, connect, company, call, care, cause, celebrate, change, companion, common. So I, I just looked up all the C words there just for giggles. But all this to say there's this friendship thing, fellowship. Right in the middle of this fellowship word is this friendship, friends with God. And, and God went the distance so that we could be friends with him that God wanted to be friends with you first. Is that amazing? You know, um, years ago I heard, how do you make friends? Well, first of all, you have to be a friend. And, and Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, he took the first step, right? Because the Bible says that before you even knew him, he died for you. So he takes this first step to bring you into friendship with God, the one who created you and designed you, and he loves you, and he brought you in, not because you're oh so smart or oh so short or oh so tall. Or it was God's plan to draw you in into this friendship. So this friendship with God. And interesting, when you think about it, he, he desires for you to choose him too, but he's taken the first step. And what's, what's interesting is right after, right after, in the garden, in the creation of all things, God, in a sense, wanted to see if the first man and the woman would also choose to be friends with him. So you know the story, and I'll just condense it. He basically said, look, I've given you this whole garden. You can do whatever you want. It's anything you want, you can do except for one one rule, just one choice, and that's not to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden there. Don't touch the tree. Now, that's like saying, don't touch the wet paint. You know, there it was. And so he, God, so loved, and they had everything they could ever want from a loving father, from a loving creator. And he said, just don't do this. And they chose poorly. They chose the this over this relationship with God. And so then the Bible shows that there's a thread that runs all the way to Jesus that says, I'm going to give you another chance. Now, choose again. But this time, just one choice will bring you back into this relationship with this, your creator God, and that's Jesus. Amen? Isn't that amazing? One choice to mess up, but one choice to come back. Not five or ten or two hundred, one. Right there, because once he has your heart, you'll do anything for him. You know that, don't you? Once God has your heart, you can just say, how high do you want me to jump? Where do you want me to go? I'll do anything for you. That's the kind of relationship that Christ died for. Not half in and half out, full on. And that's why we talked about that last week. He wants that kind of relationship. That's a true love relationship. So the Creator has designed you to love Him back by following Him with all of your heart. So there's some examples of, of this relationship throughout the Bible. Uh, Abraham is an example of a relationship, and it said that 
Abraham was the, the man of faith. He just believed it so much so he was willing to sacrifice his son for crying out loud. That's, he loved God more than anything. He'd do anything for him. What an example of this belief and in, in, in trust in this relationship. And then we get, of course, Moses. And it says of Moses that Moses spoke to God as a man speaks with a friend. Is that, is that amazing? And maybe that's you. Maybe you have that relationship that is so personal that you can talk to him any time and you understand that and you sense and know that he's right there. And the way that you're there is when you're completely emptied of your own self and you're saying, Lord, fill me. That's when you start to really engage in this friendship. God completely taken over. So that's what he talked about Moses. And then it says of Jesus, the Savior, it says that he was a friend of sinners like you and me. And even the worst sinners of all. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Is that, is that beautiful? It says of him, the one befriending all who would trust and follow him. And in John 15, it says he came and lay his life down for his friends. It says he laid his life down for his friends. That's an amazing kind of love. That's the most kind of love, is that one would give his life for another. So if you're taking notes, the cross references John chapter 15, verse 13 and 15, through 15. So it's an amazing thing to think about this relationship with God and how important that is and how intimate that God wants that relationship to be. And you know the person that introduced you to Jesus. Even right now, you're thinking of that person that introduced you to Jesus. Now, for many of you, it may have been your mom or dad or maybe an uncle or maybe a youth preacher or something like that. But I was thinking about this. Who was that? Who was that person that introduced you to Jesus? The, the one for me, his name was Pete, and he introduced me to Jesus. God bless them. And you know, in a way they were saying, I wrote this down, in a way they were saying, um, I want you to, I want you to meet a friend of mine. And this friend is going to change your life. His name is Jesus. And he's going to change your life forever. So when you became a friend of Jesus, he began to change your world. Your, there was a different way of thinking. And it's interesting, like friends, the more you hang around with certain friends, either they're going to rub off on you or you're going to rub off on them, or maybe both, but this Jesus, the best friend that you will ever have, he's going to rub off on you. And you'll begin looking like him and walking and talking like him. At the men's study on Saturday, we just went around the circle and asked, uh, tell me about one of your best friends when you were growing up. And uh, so it was fun to hear about that. And maybe even right now you can think about that best friend. And maybe they, maybe they weren't following the Lord. Maybe they are today. But there was a piece of the puzzle that there was something about it that God was using. So, um, so understanding, just nailing this, first of all, is that God is a God of relationship. And he sent Jesus to draw you into this relationship with your creator. So I say to my grandkids every time they're over the house, I say, God loves you and so do I. You know? And that's, that's what God is doing. And, and some of you heard this, this one that has been on, uh, I don't know, the cartoon. Um, God made you special and he loves you very much. And each of you sir, are special to God, no matter where you've been, you're special, and he loves you very much. And I, I, I just want to say something right here, that as um, I've been, our family's been here for tw over 20 years, and just stepping into this new role as lead pastor, I hope you know that God loves you, and so do I. I, I hope you know that when, 
when I talk to you and when I pray for you and when I'm teaching that it's out of love for God and love for you, that I care for each one of you. And Natalie and I pray over you, and, and I want to say that for Natalie too. That So um, there's things that we're going to do, though, that might not look like love sometimes because each one of us burn the toast sometimes, right? And so this, this relationship thing requires forgiveness. There's not a relationship here that doesn't um, work with forgiveness because there's only one perfect one, and that's Jesus, right? So in order for any relationship to work, we've got to be willing to forgive each other or it isn't going to work. So I want to just say right, right now, um, last week, or was it the week before, I, I came late. And, and so I burnt the toast for some of you that arrived here early, and the doors were still unlocked. And, oh, do I care for you? I do. I, sorry I was late. So thank you for forgiving me. You, you scraped the, the toast. You scraped the burnt off the toast. So thank you for doing that. And, but, but know that... Um, Natalie and I want to want to love you and 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 into the future what God wants for you and what God wants for us together as a family. Okay, so here's here's the twist right here, and here's why so so much of why the Holy Spirit. Okay, now all those who um, are befriended by God are brought into communities. A community of friendships, and it's called the church. We can now befriend others as God in Christ befriended us. Okay? So just look around. God has caused you, and he desires you to be friends with each other. Okay? And so some of us, are not so outgoing, and it's a difficult thing to do to, you know, begin that friendship thing. But he desires that his kids get along, okay? God wants his kids to get along and to even love each other. And so because God has orchestrated us in this group here and even at Evergreen, he wants you to get along. And so you and I have to make the effort to go out of our comfort zone and Try to become better friends. And um, one of the first things to do, just a little tip here, and you already know it, is talk about what you have in common. You know, the weather. That's a good place to start, right? And then you step through, you know, what's important to you? What, what, what makes you tick? And, you know, and finding things in common. But he's called us to be friends, so get along, you know? And uh, so s stepping through that, it really, for a lot of us, it requires the Holy Spirit. Now, somebody like Glenn, he was born that way. So he's never met a stranger, and neither, neither has Jim Stilts back there. They just, you know, you're, it's like, who are you talking to? I'm talking to you. Oh, you're their best friend all of a sudden, you know? So some of us have to work at it, and that's okay, because then we can really, we really depend on the Holy Spirit to love one another. Okay. So that's why I, I took time with this because I've struggled with this my whole life too. Being a friend and, and wanting to be friends. Maybe there's some of you in this room, I just prefer being alone, thank you very much. I don't mind being alone. That's, no, no, no. That's not, God didn't call you to be alone and just do your own thing and pray and, and go out in the woods and just you and God. He called you to be in community. You're his kid for crying out loud. So get along. So thank you for um, wanting to develop friendships with other believers. That's what we have in common. And we help each other to love people to Jesus. God first loved you, and now he wants you to love others to him. God wants to brag about you. You know how all parents, they want their children to be especially behaved in public. We all did, don't we? Those of you that kids are grown up and all that. But you just, oh, you want them to be so good in public. And when they're not, it's like, ah, oh, what's going on? 
I wonder if God feels that way about us sometimes. Oh, I want my kids to reflect me. And, and, the, and for God, of course, it's everything good. You know? So if you're his kid, guess what he wants you to be like? Be like him. So here's something crazy to think about. With God's chosen people in the past, he, um, he organized things that were signs that, that they were his kids. And many of you know the circumcision right that he gave the chosen people, that all the males would be circumcised. That would be a sign that they go through this ritual and they, they're God's chosen people. That was a sign. So there was another one. It was called the keeping of the Sabbath. That was a sign when this, this whole nation just stopped for one day. And everyone went, what? They're just stopping. For one day, they just, they honored God for that one day. And this was a sign that they were God's chosen people because they weren't continuing to work. They just stopped everything for one day and they just, they were giving glory to God. So when Jesus came, he said, there's a new commandment, a new, you could say a new sign that I'm going to give to you. And here it is. Love one another. That's a sign that the world would know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. That's why this thing is so critical. And, and that's why I'm preaching to myself is that it has been. But the more that I give in to the Holy Spirit, it's easier to reach out and to love one another. It's easier to get past myself and my own insecurities and say, I need the Holy Spirit to do this through me. So my family, when I grew up, when we went out into public, all of us just kind of hid behind mom and dad. We just, you know, it was just like, would you just, you know, just, the kids were just, the, an adult would speak to one of us and we'd duck behind. That's the kind of family that I came from. It's like, no, there wasn't anybody just stepping out, just talking. All the kids were just kind of hiding. Maybe you've come for that. Maybe not. But the Holy Spirit says, you know what? There's something bigger going on here. The world will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. That's going to look different. But for sure, we're going to look the same because we're going to care for one another. Okay. I knew I was going to get to this point because in Acts chapter uh, 2, we've only been on one verse. And I haven't even finished it because it still says, then there's the, the break, uh, breaking of bread and prayer. So we'll come back next week and we'll finish that off. But, but even that part is a part of fellowship. If you think about it, the breaking of bread is, is taught, and, and I looked up different commentaries on this. This, this could be the Jesus, um, the Last Supper practice, the communion, but it also could be they were sharing a meal together, or it could be both, that they, they were doing both. And if you think about how intimate it is to, first of all, do communion with a group of people, that's pretty intimate because you're talking about this relationship with, with God. But also, when you share a meal with, some, with someone, most of the time, it's someone you know. It's an intimate relationship. You just don't go up to a stranger and say, hey, how about if we have lunch to get, what? No, it's an intimate thing. And so it's no wonder that these people were being taught about fellowship and in fellowship comes sharing a meal together. And then this thing called prayer. And even as I said earlier, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus, you've been talking to him. It just gets kind of scary sometimes when when you come to a prayer meeting, they say, why don't you pray? And you go, I'm not used to this. Well, you've been talking to him already. You're just inviting others to hear you talk to the one who's your best friend. So in a way, relax. We're brothers and sisters. Relax and enjoy the relationship with God and each other.